I'm very pleased to welcome to the stage in just a moment uh, Dr. Todd Sizer, who serves as Vice President of Smart Optical Fabric and Device Research at Nokia Bell Labs. And in this role, Todd leads teams responsible for systems and uh, device optical solutions for core, submarine, and uh, data center communications. Previously, he has spent years leading the wireless research effort in Nokia Bell Labs, um, driving the vision and actually the research behind, behind 5G. And today, he will be addressing how industrial IoT will change society. So let's hear from Todd Sizer. Todd. Steve? Uh, hey. Good to see you. Thank you. Yeah, come on, have, have a seat. <clears throat> I thought we would uh, <clears throat> give you a chance um, to say a little about what you're doing. And, and we all want to know uh, what the heck is smart optical <laughs> fabric and device research. So smart, smart optical fabric is part of smart network fabric. It's the IP and fiber optical connections that you make between the different access points. In earlier days, those were really set and forget networks. You set them up and they sat there and did their thing and uh, served their purpose. But as we move towards the 5G era and the need for more uh, higher performance networks, uh, you need to have a lot more flexibility. And so flexibility in the optical domain, flexibility in the IP domain to provide very high reliability, very high speeds, ever higher speeds. And so that smart comes from uh, the ability to dynamically adapt your network as, it, as, as, it, as its needs arise. <clears throat> well, Bell Labs have always had an outstanding uh, reputation uh, for innovation. And it sort of struck me that uh, we were talking uh, earlier that uh, Nokia no longer is in the handset business, but you're doing device research, uh, which is critical you know, in, the, in the 5G world. Tell us a little about device research and what you're focused on. You know, all our carriers have different slices of spectrum, and I'm always concerned about it. Will my spectrum accommodate the devices that are coming available? Are all devices going to run on all spectrum slices? Or let's talk a little about that. So, uh, so clearly, spectrum is a, is an important issue. It's a, an issue certainly here in the U.S. as well as bro broadly. And so, folks that build devices need to build them for all areas of the world in order to get the volume to drive the cost down. But the thing that we've been concerned about uh, in the past uh, is if you look back over the past 30 years. We, together, our industry has really enabled quite a remarkable transformation. Uh, our ability to connect with people any place on the planet like that is something quite new. It's something quite unique. Uh, it's something that we didn't have uh, uh, even 15 years ago. 15 years ago, we felt grateful if we stuck our head out the window and were able to make a phone. And, and today, when my son texts his girlfriend on the couch and doesn't hear back from her in 20 seconds, he starts to get physically uncomfortable <laughs> because that expectation now is that we're connected at all times and all places. It's really been remarkable. I mean, think of Twitter driving the Arab Spring and now in politics here in the US. Uh, that was enabled by us. And, um, and so the, the the connection that we've been able to together make has been quite remarkable. And during that time, we certainly have helped to build big industries. So the web scale industries have really grown to be quite dominant. Uh, and, and that growth has been wonderful for them, but we haven't really seen the same benefit in a general way for the general purpose in, in Silicon Valley and in outside Silicon Valley. Um, and so we at Bell Labs have been trying to understand why. Why is that? Why is it that, that we're seeing so much benefit to the IT industry, but it hasn't had the kind of industrial revolution impact of, say, in the 50s when transportation really helped raise the opportunity for everybody in the country? Um, 
And we think the reason is, is that the investment in communications, the investment in the sorts of services that we provide, really has been dominated by the digital industries. And the digital industries, uh, you know, certainly web skills are one, occupy about 30% of our economy in the US. And so for those industries, we're seeing productivity growths that are dramatic. They're 3% per year. They're, they're, they're really growing in a quite substantial way. That 3% is about what we saw in the 50s in a, in for, for the entire US economy. And if, but if you look at the physical industries, which are 70% of our, of our economy, they're only growing at about 0.7% per year. And so it's clear to understand why the benefits that we have brought with being connected at all times and in all places uh, hasn't, hasn't transformed the physical industries because they haven't been able to invest. So we see that as being that investment in, in, in the use of our technology, communication technology, to solve problems in the physical industries as a great untapped opportunity for us and a great way that we can help to impact society as a whole, hoping to bring the, the wealth and opportunity that Always Connected brings to a much broader set of, of people in our country. <clears throat> well, obviously, you uh, live, breathe, and eat this uh, every day. Uh, actually, uh, you're coming from a, 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 an institution that's uh, uh, fabled uh, innovation is uh, par excellence. So uh, we want to pick your brain a little. Mm -hmm. we, wanna, we want to ask you to glaze in that you know, crystal ball and say, OK, where should these carriers put their bets in the 5G world? What's, what's coming first? What do some of the, um, uh, your research shows that, that is one or two or three of the things that are overlooked mm -hmm. as we move? We had extensive discussions the other day about <clears throat> transitioning from 4G to 5G and you know, what do you do to the network, network architecture. What are some of the things that you see immediately on the horizon and where would you put your resources? Well, first, the thing, thing to point out is don't wait for 5G. I think there are an awful lot of things that you can do with 3G and 4G, uh, working together with your customers, together with your enterprises in your regions, uh, to bring benefits of communication now. Now, 5G will have some attributes that will help it work better, longer battery life, perhaps higher, higher speeds if you need them. So, so there is there is value, of course, in 5G, and and the research that I that my, I led my team in 5G, obviously, is going to help that. But uh, don't wait. Um, start now with industrial applications. So, what are some of the big applications? Well, obviously, manufacturing, transportation, logistics, mining, agriculture. Uh, all of these uh, are in what we call the what we call the physical industries. These are transportation of people and things, and manufacturing, of course. And estimates of what the opportunity that communications could bring to those industries is somewhere between four and eleven trillion dollars. It's an enormous worldwide, worldwide, of course. <clears throat> And of that four to eleven trillion dollars, uh, about a quarter of it is what can be accessed by us in this room, uh, by the communications industry. So somewhere between one and four trillion dollars. Now, for scale, the entire worldwide communications industry is a trillion dollars. So what I'm talking about is at the low side, doubling the size of our opportunity at the high side, quadrupling the size of opportunity. Yeah. By taking the technologies that we have now with 3 and 4G, improving them with 5G to serve applications that can enable not only the digital industries that we've been doing such a great job in enabling up to now, but now extending it to the 70% of our economy that is in the physical industries. Um, now you're you're in what twelve countries, <clears throat> global uh, Bell Labs. focus. Bell Labs. Bell I mean, Labs. Nokia is, is uh, yeah, Nokia. Yeah, yeah. But Bell Labs, which I 
didn't understand that you'd actually grown since the last acquisition. Well, Bell Labs was, was, uh, was first AT&T, and then it was Lucent, and then in 2005, we were purchased by Alcatel, and then in 2016, purchased right. by the Finns in Nokia. So we have a history, but, and with that, became, uh, we became a lot more international, which has been great. Um, and so I lead teams in uh, Ireland, Germany, France, and here in the US. So what are some of the lessons you're learning uh, overseas in other countries that are trying to figure out this 4G, 5G transition? What are you seeing as the uh, priority and some of the, these opportunities that you talked about? What's coming first? So it, it depends on the different regions. So one, uh, one example I can give is, um, is one of my teams are in Stuttgart, Germany, which is the Detroit of Germany. It has Porsche and Daimler there. And they've set up a, a, a test suite a factory. So it's a factory floor where companies can bring their ideas to this factory floor and try them, bringing 5G and the capabilities of 5G to automotive manufacturing and the flexibility that that can bring. One of the things that our, our customers there, so the Bosches and the Daimlers of the world, they have factory floors. They're very roboticized. So they have a lot of robots, mm. but they don't make the same thing every day. They might make one sort of thing. So Daimler, uh, so, so Bosch, for example, makes both auto parts and dishwashers, and they might make them on the same floor. And so today, this morning, they're making dishwashers, and this afternoon, they're making alternators, right? And so having robot, robots that can very flexibly move uh, was, is, their, is, is essential for their business. And what they found is that the wired robots were just getting in the way. They were kept on running over their cables and causing problems. The, so, so the reliability of their factories was not where it needed to be. So we came in and did trials with Bosch to show that you could, do, you could have wireless connectivity to these robots on the manufacturing floor uh, in order to enable the flexibility that they need in their industry to drive their industry. Wow. So you just change out the software? And you change out the, they change out the connections so that instead of being a wire connection, it's now a, an LTE connection, uh, soon to be 5G, but, but the first tests were at LTE. And so that's an example in a manufacturing setting that, that has gotten a lot of interest. We have, um, so two, two uh, other areas where we're seeing a lot of interest and a lot of opportunity is in the mining industry where the, in mining there's a lot of uh, uh, a need for advanced safety. There's a lot of need for autonomous movement of people and machines. And so being able to support that in a flexible way, we're, we're building in private LTE systems which are connected to the public LTE systems uh, served by service providers such as yourself because obviously the miners, the mining company doesn't want to be in the communication business. They just want to enable their business with it. Right. Another application area which is, looks to be very, very exciting is agriculture, where not only autonomous uh, uh, farm vehicles, which we've, we've seen a lot uh, in the past, but also more precise, more pre precision fertilizer, more precision feeding and seeding. Uh, using that technology through advanced feedback, uh, through, through coordination of other types of sensing, uh, has shown a 23% reduction in the amount of fertilizer needed, 15% uh, reduction in the amount of seed you need, needed, and overall yield numbers which are in the 27% growth yeah. sort of rate by the automation <coughs> that, that uh, the industrial IoT can bring. Yeah, I was um, listening to the Secretary uh, Purdue, Secretary of Agriculture uh, in Washington uh, a couple months ago, and it was astounding the increase in uh, production rates yeah. uh, based on uh, precision agriculture. The other aspect, which uh, is unfortunate for our times, but, uh, but could be very valuable, is if you're able to, very, uh, to track, say, lettuce from a particular field and track that by use of IoT technology, 
then if, God forbid, you have an outbreak like we had last year with romaine lettuce, and all of a sudden we had to throw away all romaine lettuce from all of California, imagine if you could track the offending lettuce to a particular field. You not only could target the problem and solve the problem, but you also wouldn't have this enormous wastage and, and economic cost to the agriculture industry as a result. So, the, the advantages of advanced tracking and precision agriculture are, are huge. The, the, let's go back just for a second. We <clears throat> have another minute. How, how are you going to make sure that, or how our carriers can be uh, sure that the devices that are out there, the tracking or the, the chips that are out there, actually communicate and operate on their network and are the same, you know, spectrum slices. I mean, what is, are we going to have uh, devices that are, uh, that operate on all spectrum? Is it going to be, uh, you know, smart uh, devices? I mean, we're talking clearly, about, clearly there know, has a, to be a penny, a, a nickel to a dime or something That's right. uh, of devices. And, and that intel, that, will, that intelligence capability will be built into that chip. So, so as you indicated, Nokia is not in the device business, so right. I can't really talk to what my device partners are doing, but, but clearly your point is well taken. And there, the device industry really is driven by volumes. And so they need to bring to the industry consensus on which bands are going to be the ones that we believe will be most used in the future. We, we have seen that Wi-Fi has its role, but it isn't robust enough and reliable enough and, and provide the kinds of range you need to be an economic solution. So you're going to need to have the LTE solutions that we bring to the table, narrowband IoT solutions, as, as an early example, 5G future. But you're absolutely right. There has to be a, a, a consensus on what the, the two or three bands are that this integrated circuit that costs a couple of pennies is, is going to be connecting with. Well, so the, the nugget here is don't wait for 5G. Don't wait. Don't wait. There's a <coughs> there huge are, opportunity. Huge there are opportunity. things right now that we can uh, do. And, and society will benefit, doing. we hope. Yeah. And uh, Nokia uh, has some solutions for all of us, correct? Absolutely. If you want to talk more, I, I have some examples. That sounds great. Uh, that's here for Mr. Thanks. Sizer. Todd. <clears throat> Thank you so very much. Thanks very much. Very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, you know, after you. <clears throat> We're going to have a, <clears throat> another speaker come up. Uh, we've got a 15-minute session here that we're going to do with, uh, with TNS. And uh, I wanted to get my little comments out here for, um, for Mike Keegan. And uh, so I lost my place here. So Mr. Keegan.